Okay, so we'll um, we'll begin. It is uh, week six. Sorry, I'm yawning again. Okay, um, <clears throat> week six, and um, so we'll take a look at um, the island hopping example uh, some more, and then we'll uh, we'll look a little bit more at the uh, the metropolis algorithm, and. Um, yeah, and then on um, on uh, Friday, um, we'll, we'll look at more uh, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm and things like that. Okay, so anyway, um, so this is our island hopping example. We said said we have a, an island with seven chains, and the islands are numbered uh, by theta from theta equal one in the west to theta equals seven in the east. And their populations are proportional to their island number. And we want to be able to visit the, um, the islands proportional to their population. And so the target distribution is this, um, 1 over 28 through 7 over 28. And that, will, that way, the, um, the, the probabilities add up to 1. And, and it fits kind of the, the criteria that the, uh, how often we visit is proportional to the island's population. OK, and so this is our algorithm that um, each morning, the politician flips a coin. If it lands heads, we propose the island um, on the west. And if it lands tails, we propose the island uh, on the east. Uh, he checks the, uh, the population of the proposed island and the population of the current island. And if the proposed island has a bigger population than the current island, we, um, he's going to definitely go to that island. And if the proposed island has a smaller population than the current island, um, he goes to the island probabilistically. And the probability of going to the island is going to be p move. And p move is calculated by taking p proposed divided by P current. Okay, so we take the probability of the proposed location and we divide that by the probability of the current location. Okay, and these probabilities are the um, probabilities that come from our target distribution. And then, um, and then we draw a random U, and if U is less than P move, we're going to go to the island, and if not, we stay. Okay, and we showed that uh, we can find the transition probability matrix. And we found the left eigenvector, which is equal to our stationary distribution. And, um, and we showed that the stationary distribution is equal to the target distribution. That's what we did on Friday of last week. OK, um, what we didn't actually do was actually run the Markov chain itself. OK, so we, we found the transition probability matrix, but we didn't actually run the Markov chain. So that's what we're going to do now, OK? So the Markov chain is going to kind of go um, just one iteration at a time. And, uh, and the politician is going to kind of move from one island to, the, to another, right? So what we have to do is we have to propose um, a value. x proposed is going to be the current value x at time t plus 1 with probability 5, or x at time t minus 1, the current value minus 1 with probability 0.5. OK, and then we're going to calculate the probability of P move and P move is going to be um, P proposed divided by P current. Um, technically, for it to be a probability that that value has to um, has a max value of one. So if the proposed location has a higher probability than the current location, this ratio is going to be greater than one. So we have to say P move is equal to the max of one or p proposed, I'm sorry, not max, it should be min. OK, this is a mistake. <laughs> OK, so I need to write min, the minimum of um, um, the minimum of all of this. OK, sorry. this. OK, so um, uh, 
Okay, so the minimum of one and p proposed and p current, okay? So if p proposed ends up being greater than p current, this value is gonna be greater than one. And so we will take one. And if it's, um, if p proposed is less than p current, then we're gonna just take whatever this is, okay? So we are going to, um, so we get p move and we decide to move if, um, you know, random value u is less than p move. And if so, then we will set the next value x at time t plus one equal to x proposed. And if u is greater than p move, then we don't move and we keep the current value, okay? The current location x at time t becomes x at time t plus one. So you kind of just recycle the same value. Okay, so I, I went ahead and I coded um, exactly that, okay? So propose is gonna be a function and it's gonna be a function based on the current value because the value that it proposes depends on the current value. And so the um, proposed value is gonna be the current value plus, and I'm just gonna randomly select one or minus one. Okay, so I do sample one or negative one and I just want one of those values. So uh, the proposed value is gonna be the current plus one or minus one. Okay, and that, that fits this criteria right here for the proposed proposal um, function. Okay, the, um, what we need is we need a way to get our target distribution, which is just one through seven divided by 28. Okay, and so it's gonna be a function of X, whatever value, whatever location we're in. And this function is gonna return X divided by 28. It's gonna check if X is in one through seven. So if X is an integer, one through seven, then it will return x divided by 28. Otherwise, it'll return zero, okay? And this, this is a vector vectorized form so that, you know, we can give p, um, you know, any kind of value. And if it's anything other than these integers, one through seven, it's gonna return zero. Otherwise, it'll return um, x over 28. Okay, so um, I will just go ahead and run 1,000 iterations of this. And so X will be my vector where I'm gonna store my lo um, values. And so I'm gonna start off uh, just for this chain, I'm gonna start at the location four, okay? I'm gonna start at the location four and then I'm just gonna leave a bunch of blank um, NAs here. And then we're gonna start, um, we're gonna say for time at T in one through N minus one, okay? So for T in one through basically uh, 999, okay? I'm gonna say my current value is x at time t. And then um, I'm gonna use the propose function to take my current value and either add one or negative one to it. And that's gonna be my proposed value. And then I calculate p move, which is p proposed divided by p current. Okay, so we take the, uh, the probability. This is our target distribution, right? So we're gonna calculate the probability probability of the proposed value, and we're gonna divide by the probability of the current value, okay? And um, and I, I just go ahead and use P move. So if P move is the minimum of one and P proposed divided by P current, but if, um, if P move is greater than one, then uh, the random U here, so if I use um, U R even if one, the, um, this number is always going to be less than one. So I don't, I don't actually have to bother with taking the minimum between P move and P propose, at least for the purposes of the algorithm. Like for mathematical reasons, we have to say P move is bounded by one so that you don't get probabilities greater than one. But at least for the purposes of the algorithm, I can just compare you, is it less than P move, right? Okay, so I'm just going to say if, uh, if U is less than P move, then the proposed value will become x at time t plus one. Otherwise, the current value becomes x at time t plus one. Okay, so this I'm just this code is exactly will run the uh, Metropolis algorithm. Is that all right? Okay, so um, I run that code, and these are my results. Okay, so I count. Um, I'm going to take the uh, summary. Uh, so we get a chain. And we're just going to count up how many times we uh, we got each of the numbers one through seven, 
And then I'm, I'm going to turn them into relative frequency by doing counts divided by n. And then I'm going to compare that to the theoretic distributions or the target distribution. Okay. And so um, this is what I got. Okay. Uh, number seven should appear um, seven out of 28 or one fourth of the time. And when we did our Markov chain, it appeared 267 times out of 1,000. Okay. So, um, so I can do a chi squared test to see if, you know, is there a significant difference between the, uh, the counts and the target probabilities? And it comes back and it says, you know, there's not a significant difference. Okay. So we see um, pretty close alignment between the empirical probabilities and the target distribution. And the, uh, the chi squared goodness of fit test also produces a large p value, um, indicating that we don't have enough evidence to say that the values generated by the Markov chain do not come from the target distribution. Okay. So great. Okay. Um, here's a bar plot comparing the empirical to the target distribution. And we see um, the empirical results by and large, for the most part, look kind of similar to the target distribution. Okay. And, um, and that's, you know, that's just one chain with a thousand iterations. Um, this is just kind of a plot of what the chain itself looks like. Um, I started off at four and then, um, you know, I flipped the coin and, you know, I happened to get five uh, and I proposed five. So I definitely went there. I pro proposed a six. So I definitely went there and here uh, I must have flipped tails. And then when I asked, do I accept or not accept? I must not have accepted because then I got six again at the same, at the next iteration. Okay. And then we get to seven and then uh, we pro proposed a six and we went there and then we must have proposed uh, seven. And then, so here's, um, we got seven in a, a row several times. So what happened here is that I might've proposed eight and I rejected that, or I might have proposed six, and I rejected that. We can't really tell, but we get seven quite a bit. Okay, and then the uh, the chain starts moving back. Okay, we end up at one. Okay, and um, and once we got to one, we might have proposed a zero and rejected it. So we ended up at one again. We might have proposed it. Um, so here we stayed at one. We must have continued proposing zero, and that's how we stayed at ones. Uh, several times in a row or a few times in a row. Okay, because then as soon as I propose it to, I'm gonna move there, all right? And, uh, and so we can kind of see the, the, uh, the chain move back and forth. And, um, and overall, um, these are the counts that we get, okay? So this is the first kind of 200 iterations and I ran it for a thousand iterations. And these are kind of the counts of uh, where we are. So this is just one possible uh, Markov chain. All right, so let me just show you what happens when I run it longer. I, I run the exact same code, okay? Run the exact same code. This time I run 100,000 iterations and I get, um, here's the empirical and the target counts. And so if we look at these probabilities, they look, um, they look pretty similar, right? So 0.368 versus 0.357. 0 0.740 versus 0 0.714, 0 0.245 versus 0.25 and things like that. Okay, and if you look at the, um, uh, the probabilities here, or the uh, kind of empirical probabilities versus target distribution, I would say they look fairly similar, okay? Um, however, if you run the chi-squared test, okay? Notice what happens with well, the chi-squared test, I get this incredibly small p-value, right? I get this very small p-value, and and this is um, this is just a limitation of the chi-squared goodness of fit test, okay? And so um, you know, in your homework, I have you guys run chi-squared goodness of fit tests, but the chi-squared goodness of fit test may or may not be the um, the the best indicator, especially if you have a very large sample. So the chi-squared goodness of fit test is generally recommended for samples uh, under 2,000. Okay, S similar to the Shapiro-Wilkes test. Um, you know, when you when you get um, samples that are you know much greater than a few thousand, um, you know, even the smallest deviation is going to appear to be significant. Okay, 
And so um, the chi-score test is very sensitive to sample size. And you know, with large samples with n greater than 2,000, the chi-score test will detect even the smallest of differences. And so, you know, what we're our sample is has a hundred thousand. So running the chi-score test here, you know, could could lead to some some issues here. Okay. So um, in these situations, you might consider using your rejection criteria, use something other than 5%. And there's a there's an interesting discussion um, at this uh, on this web page here, okay, and um, and so anyway, in short, just the chi-square test may or may not be <laughs> the best use, okay, and and don't worry if your p-value ends up small, especially if you have a very large sample size, okay, and um, excuse me, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so that in that case, you might just be better served by kind of just taking um, taking a look here and uh, and comparing. Okay. Oh, you know what? I totally forgot. We have. Um, let me uh, let me look at my view quiz answers for a second. Okay. All right. Let me um, let me give you your first view quiz answer for. Um, for today. Uh, first view quiz answer is D, D as in dog. D as in dog. D as in dog for first view quiz answer. Okay. I think that's right. Okay. So um, is this all right? Uh, as At least as far as the code goes for running the Markov chain? Uh, I just kind of want to make sure that this makes sense um, because this, this is how the Markov chain is done. Um, you know, on on Friday, we kind of multiplied the trend. We found the probabilities of the transition matrix and we um, used that to kind of find the stationary distribution. But in reality, when when we talk about running the Metropolis algorithm or a Markov chain, you know, it's going one at a time and you're generating one value at a time. Okay. And, and I'm just using kind of the, you have to write a proposal function and then p proposed versus p current and things like that. Okay, so um, let's talk about the Metropolis algorithm in general, okay? And so um, what you need is you need a function. You need a function f of x um, that is uh, proportional to the desired probability distribution p of x. Okay, so we've got some probability distribution p of x. That's our target distribution, the desired probability distribution. And we need a function that's proportional to it. Um, and then the for the algorithm, you just start at some arbitrary location, x at, x at time t, OK? Some arbitrary point to be the first sample in the Markov chain. And what we also need is you also need a proposal proposal distribution, OK? And, and again, it can be an arbitrary proposal distribution. Um, so this is going to be um, a proposal distribution that will pr produce a value x given your current value x at time t, okay? And so for the Metropolis algorithm, the proposal distribution has to be symmetric. That is that the probability of proposing a x at time x a given that you're at x b is the same as the probability of proposing x b if you're at x a. Um, and if, if it's not symmetric, then then we use the uh, Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, which um, I'll, I'll talk about on Friday, OK? So what, what we do is we uh, generate a proposed value okay, based on your current value from the distribution g of x given x at time t, OK? So given your current value, x at time t, OK? So x at time t is your current value. You're going to generate a proposed value, OK? And then we use this function f of x, which is proportional to the target distribution to calculate the probability of moving. So we get p move. p move is going to equal the minimum between 1 and f of x proposed divided by f of x at time t, or the 
uh, the current x value, right? So x current is uh, is x at time t. So you know if the proposed location has a higher probability, you know f is going to be greater than f at x time t. So we're going to move p move will be um, one, okay? And if it's less than that, then this will be this ratio is going to be less than one and we will move there with that probability all right and so we'll either accept or reject the proposed value okay and we do this by generating a random number u from the uniform distribution if u is less than p move we're going to move it move there so x at the proposed value will become the next iteration x at time t plus one and if u is greater than p move we reject the candidate value and we reuse the current value. And so we set x at time t plus one equal to our current value x at time t. Okay, so this is one thing that a markup chain will produce that's different from a kind of a continuous random variable. Okay, so a um, um, so if you drew iid values from the normal distribution or from any continuous distribution, the probability of drawing the same value twice is zero, right? The probability of drawing the same value, like uh, what's the probability that you, like from a random normal distribution, what's the probability you draw the value exactly one? You know, any exact value, the probability is close to zero. And so, you know, the probability of drawing the same value twice is zero. But with a Markov chain, you have a non-zero probability, okay, of getting the same, the same exact value showing up multiple times in your um, um, in your sample, because anytime you reject a candidate value, which which happens a decent amount of time, the current value x at time t is going to get recycled. Okay, it's going to show up again in your sample. All right, is this okay? So this is the Metropolis algorithm. It's it, it's very similar to the island hopping example, except um, f of x can now be continuous, all right, and g of x is going to be continuous as well. All right, so um, so here's here's a few things, okay, is that the function f of x only needs to be proportional to our desired target distribution p of x, okay? So this is our target distribution p of x, that's what we want, and we don't need the exact form. We can multiply p of x by some unknown positive constant c, and and that's good enough for f of x, okay? Um, because if I do p move is the minimum between one of f of x proposed divided by f of x current, okay, or x at time t, um, this is equivalent to doing um, c times p proposed and c times p current, and the c's will cancel each other, and so you know we're effectively getting we're asking is the probability um, at the proposed location, how does that compare to the probability at the current location? So it's equivalent to getting the minimum of P at X proposed versus P at X current, okay? So using, um, using a function that's proportional to the target distribution is fine, okay? So um, how is this beneficial, okay? This is uh, especially beneficial in the context of Bayesian statistics, right? So in Bayesian statistics, our posterior distribution is, you know, what is the probability of theta given your data x, okay? And, and this posterior probability is equal to the likelihood, the probability of getting your data given your um, parameter theta, multiplied by the prior distribution of theta, divided by and this part down here is the marginal probability. It's the marginal probability of getting your data regardless of the um, regardless of the parameters uh, theta. Okay, it's a norm, um, and this marginal probability. The way we find it is we um, we calculate the numerator across all possible values of theta. Right, so that yeah, if you recall what we did, you know back in, what was it, week one and week two, um, you'd calculate the denominator by finding the numerator across all possible values of theta, okay? 
And, um, and it's a normalizing constant. It's, it's not a function of, that depends on theta. It's, a, it's just a normalizing constant. And sometimes that normalizing constant can be difficult to find, okay? So instead of trying to find the exact form of this, okay, we can just use f. We can set f of theta equal to the numerator, okay? We can, we can just set f of theta equal to the numerator and the numerator is proportional, proportional to the, um, the function here, okay? And so, um, so that's, that's very useful is that you don't have to, because um, in Bayesian context, getting this uh, denominator can be, uh, can be really hard to do sometimes. And so, um, so you don't actually have to do it. If you're going to run a Markov chain um, to generate a sample, you can just use the numerator, which is generally a lot easier to, uh, to find. Okay. Right. Does that make sense? Is that good with everybody there? All right. Okay. So let's talk about the proposal distribution. I'm going to kind of present a couple of these. Okay. Just two. Um, and you can look around online for other proposal distributions. Um, but basically, the proposal distribution takes your current location, x at time t, uh, and it uses that to generate a new value. Okay. And so uh, for the Metropolis algorithm, it has to be a symmetric distribution. Um, you can have um, non-symmetric ones, but then you have to make an adjustment. That, that will be the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, all right? And so um, some common choices that work for the Metropolis algorithm are going to be a normal distribution centered at your current value x at time t with some arbitrary um, w uh, standard deviation, okay? And so we would say that the uh, proposed value, okay, your proposed value x proposed is going to come from the normal distribution where mu is equal to the current value x at time t, and you have some arbitrary sigma value here. And, you know, uh, if you want to do this in R, you would say proposed is R norm, give me one value where mean is x at time t, and standard deviation is some arbitrary value sigma, okay. Um, another choice is to use a uniform distribution centered at x at time t with some arbitrary width um, 2c, okay? And so here we would say the proposed value, x proposed, comes from a uniform distribution uh, on the range x at time t, the current value minus c up to the current value plus c, okay? And if we wanted to do this in R, we would say proposed comes from R unif. Um, where the min is x t minus c, and the this should this should be the max. Max is x t plus c. That's a okay. Well, I think you guys get the idea here. Okay. So, okay. Um, and so, and in in both of these cases, I think we can see. That um, these things are symmetric, right? So that if the uh, the distribution is centered at x t, what is the probability of generating x proposed? That would be the same as the probability of proposing x t if it's centered the other way around, right? So if like if we're centered at zero, what's the probability of proposing the value one? That would be the same as if I'm centered at one, what's the probability of proposing zero? Because it's symmetric, right? So, so this is, um, these are symmetric distributions. So it works for the R norm and R unif. R unif is just flat. So it's the same probability everywhere. Um, but then, you know, the normal distribution is symmetric. So, you know, probability proposing the value one if you're centered at zero is the same as the probability proposing zero if you're centered at one. All right, let me give you your second um, quiz answer for today. Second quiz answer is A, A as an apple. A as an apple is your second quiz answer here. All right, so um, I just kind of want to, we'll run the, uh, the Metropolis algorithm here. And so let's say our target distribution is the normal distribution centered at 15 
with a standard deviation of three. Okay, so we're going to generate values from the normal distribution centered at 15 with a standard deviation of three. The PDF of the normal distribution is this thing. Okay. Now, just to kind of illustrate that we can ignore the normalizing constant, okay, I'm going to just ignore this part, all right, and we'll just take this part over here, and we're going to say um, e to the, you know, negative one half x minus 15 over three squared, okay, so I just do, um, you know, x, x minus mu over sigma quantity squared, and, uh, and I'm just ignoring this normalizing constant in the front. Oh, sorry. Uh, quiz answer two is A as an apple. A as an apple. That was quiz answer two. Okay, so this is going to be our um, uh, function f of x. Okay, and again, f of x just needs to be proportional, proportional to the uh, target distribution. All right, and so for our proposal distribution, I'm going to use a uniform distribution centered at x t, the current value, uh, with a width of six. So, um, so we're going to generate proposed values coming from the uniform, going from x at time t minus three, going up to x at time t plus three. Okay, and just to kind of show you um, why uh, this algorithm is so so useful and so good is that I'm going to start at this really, really, really terrible location. Okay, and we're going to say x at time t or x at, you know, with t being time zero or time one, we're going to set that value to be 100. Okay, x at time one is 100. Because so if you think about the normal distribution, it's centered at 15. And we know that 99.7% of values are within three standard deviations of the mean, right? So 99.7% of values are going to be between six and 24. Okay. So um, how often would this normal distribution produce a value of 100? It will like, it should never do that, right? In real life, this is 100 is um, what, 85. So that's, I don't know, it's like 30 standard deviations away, 20, 20, uh, 28 standard deviations away or something, okay? So that, that's, a, that's a ridiculous number here, okay? Um, but we'll just go ahead and run it, okay? And let's just see what happens. So this is my uh, function f that's proportional to the target PDF, okay? And then my proposal function, okay, takes my current value and generates um, a value going from uh, current minus three to current plus three, okay? And, um, and we try this out, okay? So, um, so I'm gonna generate 5,000 values. My first value is 100. And then this part of the code is actually uh, remains the same, okay? I take uh, x at time t starting out uh, t equal to one going up through n minus one. x at time t is gonna be my current value. And then I use the propose function to generate a value based on the current value. This is proposed. And then we calculate the function f at the proposed value divided by the function f at the current value. And that becomes p move. And then we'll either accept or reject p move here. Okay. And so we just do this one iteration at a time. And this is what the chain looks like. Okay. So we started off at 100. And the chain um, just keeps moving down, 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 until we get to kind of the the region of uh, like a reasonable region, right? So um, a reasonable region is 15 plus or minus basically two standard deviations. So you know most of our values should be between nine and 21. Okay, each standard deviation is three. So. Uh, and so when we do that, we find, you know, it starts off at 100 and the chain just keeps going down until we get to around somewhere between 9 and 21. And then from there, it just keeps generating values between, um, you know, kind of in that regional region. Okay. So even though I started at um, 100, the chain kind of manages to find the region uh, where f of x is pretty high, okay? The probability of getting these values is high. 
within about, you know, it looks like 150, 180 iterations or so. And then once it reaches that region, it kind of appears to generate values from the normal distribution, right? So it kind of continues to produce these values here. All right, and so, you know, um, maybe I should include a, a picture here. So what's what's kind of happening is that if you think of what what the normal distribution looks like, okay, or at least a a function, um, a function that looks like the normal distribution, okay. So here's our let's say here's our distribution that that we want, okay. It's centered at fifteen, and most of the values. Uh, that looks terrible. Okay, but um, <laughs> I don't know how to draw a normal curve here. All right, so the values should go like this, right? But then, um, if you if you kind of zoom in asymptotically, this this becomes pretty 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 flat. Okay, and we're starting off at say like one hundred out here. Okay, and so and I'm generating my first kind of values. I'm generating basically from 97 to 103 because my proposal distribution is um, X proposed comes from the uniform of basically the current minus three to the current plus three, okay? And so if we look at what happens, if I propose anything between 197, okay, the probability, these probabilities are greater than my current probability, right? The probability, anything closer to the mean, okay, will have a greater probability than 100. So uh, if, we, if we think of, you know, what is, what is my f of x? Uh, f of x is this, and so, you know, if, if x is 100, I've got 100 minus 15 squared, and that, you know I'm raising it to a negative power, so that's going to be a tiny value. But then if I take any value less than a uh, closer to 15, you know this difference between x and 15 will get smaller, and so this probability is going to get bigger. And so anything that that's closer to um, to 15, any value that gets proposed is going to get accepted. Okay. Whereas values that get farther away Technically, it's not impossible to move in the opposite direction, but moving farther away, you know, only happens probabilistically. Okay, so this looks like there was a stretch where I kept proposing values, I kept going farther away, and it just said no, I, I don't want to accept those values. Okay, so um, so in the beginning, we just keep moving closer and closer and closer to 15, and then finally around here we start, you know, I'm at like 22 or something, and I try proposing, you know something a little bit farther away and, and we start to take a step backwards and stuff, okay? And then finally, until we get to something close to 15, we start bouncing around. So um, so what happens is it just kind of, the, the chain will find the, uh, the region. Okay, so anyway, um, I throw away, I'm gonna throw away these first values, okay? Because I know these are no good, okay? This is what we call the burn-in period, okay? Where we, gave it a terrible starting location and we just let the chain run and do its thing okay because when you let the chain run it's going to naturally favor areas of higher probability okay because it, it always if the proposed location has a higher probability it's always going to move in that direction okay and and if the proposed location has a lower probability sometimes it'll move in the lower probability okay so so these first kind of 150 180 values or so are what we call burn-in values. We started at a terrible location and it took the, the, uh, the algorithm a little bit of time to en enter a, a region where it's producing reasonable values. And so we're gonna keep the reasonable values, we throw away the, the burn-in values. So I throw out um, values one through 180 and we're gonna call this X keep. And here is a histogram of the values I've kept, okay? Histogram of the values I kept, I plot a density curve on top of it and we see okay it it's a decent fit okay it's not perfect but we get a decent fit all right 
And so, you know, when you, when you use the Metropolis algorithm, you can give it some poor starting conditions, especially if you don't know very much about the target distribution, you don't know what's a, what, what, what's an area of high probability. Okay. So even if you don't know that much about the target distribution, you can give it some poor starting conditions and then you let the chain kind of run to find regions where the, um, where samples or the probabilities are high. All right, here is the empirical CDF in black plotted against the, um, the, um, the normal CDF, okay? And we get pretty close alignment, not, not perfect, perfectly so, okay? And, uh, and that's that. Okay, um, there's, a, there's this question, whenever you talk about the Metropolis algorithm or the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, there's a question of efficiency, okay? In the absolute ideal case, and this is never going to be the happen, is that the values generated by the chain would resemble random independent draws from the target distribution. This will never happen because the Markov chain just by its nature produces correlated values. The next value it produced depends on your current location. Okay, so it's not going to, it's never going to produce independent values is that the next value it produces will depends on the current value. So you get correlated values. But just to kind of show you what the ideal is, okay, in the in this imaginary ideal scenario, the the values look like their IID um, IID. And so here's what a chain of 1000 IID values would look like. Okay. And is that they're just kind of bouncing all over the place, covering kind of the range of what you expect to see from a normal distribution. Okay going anywhere from six to 24 ish, basically. All right, so this is what IID looks like. Now, when we looked at our, the values that were produced by our chain, okay? So here are the um, values that we have in X keep, okay? This looks a little bit different from this, okay? We, we do see it bouncing around, but we can also see that there is still quite a bit of you know, correlation that, you know, the value down next at each step, we can kind of trace a path and say like the previous value was, you know, close by or things like that. And that's because it's, you know, always kind of producing um, the, the next value it proposes is going to either be three above, you know, somewhere between three above and three below, right? It could, it could be even closer. It could be like, you know, um, one half away or one away or something like that. But we're just proposing values anywhere from plus three or minus three um, uniformly. And so this is kind of the, the chain that I get. So we could try experimenting with wider proposal distributions or narrower proposal distributions. And I just kind of want to show you what happens. Okay, so I'm, um, we had a proposal distribution with a width of six plus or minus three, but um, I'm gonna try having distributions with a width of 100, with a width of one, with a width of 12, okay? And for each of these chains, I'm gonna start at 15, so I don't have to worry about throwing away burn-in values, right? Because, so just initially we started off at 100, but for all of these, I'm gonna go ahead and start off at 15. So we're already in kind of the target region. Okay, so what happens if I have a width of a 100, okay? So my proposed value goes, we'll pr propose a value from current minus 50 to current plus 50. Okay, we're going to start at 15. This code is exactly the same as before. And this is what the chain looks like. Okay, so we get a bunch of kind of flat regions. We, you know, you get kind of something that looks like a cityscape or something with these skyscraper looking things. And what's happening here is that the proposed values, because my proposal distribution is so wide, the, a lot of the proposed values fall in uh, regions with very low probability, right? So I start off at 15 and, you know, I might propose a value like 50, okay? Well, the target distribution will say, I'm never going to accept a value like 50. And so it's just going to reject that value, okay? So, um, so what happens is that I, I'm just, whenever you see a flat region, just means you kept re generating or proposing values that were terrible. You're, you're proposing values that were getting rejected. And whenever you, it gets rejected, the current value of X gets um, entered into the chain again. 
So what we're seeing is this value of around you know, 15 and a half just gets recycled over and over and over again for uh, quite a few iterations because all of the values that were being proposed at the time were terrible. Okay, And then finally, we propose a decent value of like 14 or something and we accept it. Um, and then, you know, we accept some values and, it, and the chain moves a bit, but then again, there's periods where all the values we're proposing are just kind of terrible values. And so, um, so you get these flat regions. So this is an indicator that your proposal distribution is proposing values that are too, too far away, okay? All right, on the other hand, what if your proposal distribution has a small width, okay? A width of one. And so I'm going to generate values current minus one to current plus uh, current minus one half to current plus one half. Again, we start at 15. And this is what my chain looks like. Okay. So here my chain just kind of um, just keeps moving about. It looks almost like the random walk, the where we said like the, the stock market stuff. Okay. And so, you know, what's happening here is that when the proposed value X is uh, the proposal distribution is very narrow, okay? The proposed value of X is gonna be kind of very close to your current value of X, okay? So the X proposed, depending on how, how narrow your inner uh, proposal distribution, you can, it might be reasonable to say X proposed is gonna be approximately equal to X current, okay? All right, and if X proposed is approximately equal to X current, then, you know, this is very generalized, but F of X proposed is gonna be approximately equal to X, F of X current, okay? Uh, if these two values are very similar in value, then these two values will also be similar in value, which means uh, P move, okay, which is the ratio between F of X proposed and F of X current, uh, it, that probability of moving is going to be something close to one. Okay, if, if those if these two values here and here are similar to each other, the probability of moving is going to be close to one. And so, nearly every proposed value is going to get accepted. But the problem is that the chain is going to move only in tiny increments. So this this is going to result in a chain that resembles a random walk. And sometimes it can kind of drift into these uh, regions of low probability and kind of get stuck there. Um, you know, this, this is not, um, it's not a desirable property either. Okay, and then here's, here's one where I said, um, let's try a proposal distribution of width 12 and we get something that looks like this. This looks kind of decent to me, okay? And, um, you know, proper implementation of Markov chain of Monte Carlo often requires experimenting with different proposal distributions and just trying things out to see, um, to see what happens. Um, okay, I'm running out of time here. Let me give you your last quiz answer. Uh, last quiz answer is E, E as an elephant. E as an elephant, that's our last quiz answer. Okay, uh, Wednesday is a holiday. Wednesday is Veterans Day. So, you know, we want to um, say thank you and recognize our veterans. Um, uh, I don't know if Trevor wants me to call them out, but, uh, <laughs> but we thank you, um, you know. Uh, so, you know, Trevor's a veteran, so we thank we thank you. I don't know if we have any other veterans in our class, but we, uh, we do want to say thank you to all of our veterans. Um, and so Wednesday is a holiday, no class, uh, no viewing quiz. Uh, and so we'll see you guys on Friday. Okay. All right. Um, we'll see you then.